This is uh, the recorded lesson from October 10th, Friendship Class, 1 Corinthians, Lesson 7. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word that we can study and learn from. Thank you for our ability to come together. And we ask that you allow us to continue to do so. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The, let me say that this lesson is going to be a little bit uh, different. It normally would be short because we spent some time at the beginning of the of the class uh, talking about uh, business matters having to do with the the class. Uh, but it, I'm, and I may go a little beyond the the uh, uh, where we stopped. Uh, in order to uh, uh, even out the time. We're beginning in uh, chapter 8, verse 7. However, not all, and uh, I say Christian men, have this knowledge. And the knowledge has to do with uh, the... The question of eating meat sacrificed to idols. And uh, he's saying that not all men, and since he's, he's writing to Christian men, members of the church, that um, they will not be aware, uh, some of them, uh, about the uh, fact that idols mean nothing that idols represent non-existent gods, uh, which are false gods. But he says, not all uh, men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, these are uh, people who have, many have come from a Jewish background, and it, they were accustomed to the Jewish family having idols on the mantle over the fireplace and having their own family gods. And so they think that the idols may mean something, and Paul is saying they really don't. Some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. They, these are the immature people. But food will not commend us to God. We're neither the worse if we do not eat. And he's talking again, I believe, here mainly about meat. Neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours, Christian liberty, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak or the less mature. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, you more mature people, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols. If you see people who uh, may be uh, officers in the church or people that you are accustomed to looking up to, more mature people, and if you see them eating meat in the idol's uh, dinner room, then uh, they may think that it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whom sake, whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren 
and wounding their conscience when it is weak or immature, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Chapter 9 Am I not free? That's a Greek word for freedom. Am I not an apostle? I'm going to take that question up in a little bit, but the 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 Judaizers, so called, the the Jewish people that followed uh, all around, insisted that he was lying, and he's not, in fact, an apostle. And that what he's saying about the freedom is not correct, particularly that a Gentile who wants to come to Christ must first come to Judaism. He says, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? He saw him, but not while Jesus' ministry on earth was going on. Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal, phragis. And that, uh, you know, that is uh, a carving. It is a, a stamp, a seal, or a, an engraving of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, I've thrown in some uh, notes about the traditional marks of a true apostle. It is that the apostle was chosen by God from ages past, uh, based on Psalm 109. He was appointed personally by Jesus and personally sought Jesus. Now, see, this is one of the things that the people are giving uh, uh, Paul grief about, that he was not a part of uh, the close-knit group around Jesus while he was still on earth and on, during his earthly ministry. And the apostles are assigned unique ministry duties. They, one day or two to, to preach the uh, gospel, and they were given authority over demons and illnesses, uh, every illness, it says in some places. And they were the ones who were designated to write New Testament books, either because they personally wrote them or they were closely associated with those who actually wrote them. And as we know, Many of the books were written by dictation to an amanuensis or a secretary rather than writing it with their own hands. And the secretary or amanuensis was partly responsible for making sure that when they wrote the letter, that it, uh, even though they are put in, taking dictation, that it played is put in the form of good Greek. And they were to write the New Testament books as foundation of the church. And they were also promised special places of honor in the future. Now, the point is that uh, apostles, in contrast to simply disciples, the apostles were given certain kinds of authority, and one of those things was that they could expect and insist upon the people where they were working to support them, providing them food and shelter and clothing and so on. Well, let's go on. Uh, it says, My defense to those who examine me is this, those who accuse me and so on. 
do we not have a right to eat and drink in the context meaning that receive support from you do we not have a right to take along a believing wife um, we are pretty confident that Paul at least in this point uh, did not have in his company a believing wife there is uh, there are people who say that he must at one time have been married uh, he was a Pharisee and some say he was even a member of the Sanhedrin the high court which required uh, being married and so at one point um, some believe I can't be dogmatic about this was that he had a wife and we have no idea what happened to her uh, uh, Gune uh, and that's specifically female woman often translated wife even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers probably in the literal sense uh, brothers in Christ of the Lord and Cephas it's interesting that he mentions the Lord, he is an apostle of the Lord, and Cephas, uh, Peter, was an apostle um, pretty much dedicated to the reaching of Gentiles, not Gentiles, but Jews, while Paul was the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. Or do only Barnabas and I not have the right to refrain from working? Notice he, he refers to Barnabas as an apostle, and he behaved like an apostle. He was not at this time uh, the uh, partner uh, with Paul in the missionary work. Uh, Barnabas and he had had a disagreement split company and Silas is our Sylvanus is the one who is partnership in in partnership with Paul and the missionary work the only Barnabas and I only have a right to refrain from working who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense in the mission in the uh, uh, if if you have a soldier, if you have an army, you're responsible for paying them, however little that may be, and supporting them. In 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 the uh, Revolutionary War, one of the difficulties that uh, uh, they had was providing food, shelter, and sustenance for the army uh, people. Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and doesn't use the milk of the flock? It's interesting here that he mentioned using the milk of the flock. He doesn't say, and who doesn't eat an occasional sheep? I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy 25, 4, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now, since I am a southern United States person, I'm more accustomed to mules being hitched to a long pole and they wa they walk round and round and drive uh, stone things that crush uh, the stalks of uh, of uh, of the cane and which then produces juice and which is boiled down to make syrup that's what I'm accustomed to, but in the context of where of the time in which Paul is working, 
It was more common that you had oxen attached to poles who drove threshing stones who converted corn, wheat, or whatever into flour. And if you have them, they walk round and round and round, but there's going to be some refuse from uh, the grain or whatever you were grinding left, and you don't muzzle them so they can't eat some of it. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written because the plowman, the one out plowing the field, ought to plow in hope. His expectation is if he does the work of plowing the field, he can expect some of the produce coming from the field to be his. The thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. The threshing is uh, to toss the grain into the air and let the grain fall in the shaft or blown away by the is blown away from by the wind. And uh, if you do that, then if you thresh the crop, then you can expect some of the process to become yours. If we sold spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? No, nevertheless, we didn't use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. And in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, The one who has taught the word, the one who listened to the gospel as proclaimed, is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And in other places he says, Those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? Those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. I just mentioned that. But I've used none of these things. I'm not writing these things so it will be done so in my case. It would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. For I preach the gospel. I have nothing to boast of for I'm under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And I have heard people in the ministry and the pastors say, I wouldn't be a pastor if I could be in any way something else. The life is hard for a pastor. It used to be much more so. And uh, the congregation didn't. Uh, necessarily support the pastor very well nor provide for his uh, retirement and so the pastor who retired was left pretty much on his own and may not even have a place to live <sighs> woe is me if I don't preach the gospel I can't imagine doing anything else for if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, if I'm doing it because I have to, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel 
I'm an apostle. I could insist that you support me in a, uh, in a rightful manner, but I don't do that. Paul was a tent maker. That's what he learned to do to make a living. And he worked as a tent maker, sometimes partnering with a person, a fellow tent maker, and where he was at the time, so as he could provide for himself his support and not be a burden upon the people he was proclaiming the gospel to. Now, Paul got support from other places as well. For example, the, the church at Philippi uh, sent him money, sent him goods, and sent him presents. And for that reason, he wrote a thank you letter to them. But mainly, he tried to support himself by applying his trade in addition to um, preaching the gospel to the people. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win some more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, that is, uh, Gentiles, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Those who are without law is without law. Though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. That he says, distinguishing between the Jews under the law of Moses and the Gentiles who are under no such law. And he says to the weak or immature, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I'll be whatever I need to be to win people to Christ through the proclam proclamation of the gospel. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I will benefit from the gospel just, just as those to whom I proclaim the gospel. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath. Stephanos, there are two kinds of, of uh, crowns mentioned in the New Testament. One is the Stephanos, and it is the crown of victory. It's awarded to someone who's the winner in the games, but it is uh, it was originally a laurel wreath placed around the head of the winner. But some people receive other kinds of crowns through victory. But then there is another crown, the uh, diadema, which is the crown of uh, kingship. Uh, it says uh, they do it to receive the perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable, we're trying to win an imperishable wreath or crown. Therefore, I run in such a way as without, not without gain. I box. 
in the boxing match in such a way as not just beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified or lose out in the game. Now, we come to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. I think, uh, although it may be a little shorter than usual, I'm going to stop at this point, and we'll begin with chapter 10 in the next uh, lesson. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for... Uh, expounding the gospel in your word. We thank you for those who proclaim it to us and we give honor to those who do so. Father, make our hearts be open. Make us remember that we are now bought with a price and Jesus paid a terrible price to buy us. Thank you. And go with us now, for we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.